We're almost to the end of his freshman season, but we now have the full Travis Hunter experience. North Carolina a t has an injury scare while North Carolina Central has ensured a bid to the Celebration Bowl. Oh yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked on HBCU podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics. Monday through Friday, part of the Locked on podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day and remember just because your mic cuts or my mic cuts off does not mean that your journey is over it just means that it's time to follow me on twitter at south exclusives do not forget the s on the end and today's episode is brought to you by bet online they have you covered this season with more odds props and lines than ever before bet online where the game starts and i finally feel like we have the full travis hunter experience kind of encapsulate encapsulated in one game I finally feel like we've reached the point where I've had a game where I said yep that's who Travis Hunter was going to be as a freshman we see the spring game and I believe that Jackson State spring game placed unrealistic expectations on Travis Hunter Travis Hunter looked like the most unstoppable player to ever grace a football field he looked like the best offensive and best defensive player on the team and looked like he would be the best offensive and defensive player in the SWAC this year. And I think even I fed into the hype of believing that the spring game is what he was going to be as a freshman. And I'm here to go back and say I think that was a tad bit unrealistic and a little bit rushed. I think it takes a lot more game action than a spring game to become what it looked like he was going to be. And I think that he can still become that dominant two-way player. But I just don't think with the injury and all of that, I don't think he's had enough time to develop into that this year not yet maybe he'll be that next year maybe he'll be this dominant player on both sides of the ball right now I believe he can be an impactful player on both sides of the ball and that's exactly what we should have been having as his expectations going into his freshman year and some of you might have some of you might have done that I didn't I didn't I was sitting here like what would it take for Travis Hunter to be the black college football player of the year meanwhile his teammate Shador is probably going to be that You know, but that's how I was talking about Travis Hunter before the season started. And I know we've gotten bits and pieces of what Travis Hunter is and how special he can be. But I finally feel like we have the full freshman. I want to keep prefacing it that way. The full freshman Travis Hunter experience in this game versus Alabama A&M. And you have to remember, it's all building blocks. And this is what I feel like it's building to. Even if he does have a game that's better than this, this doesn't mean it's going to be his best game of the season. It just means that I finally feel like we have built up to the point to where this is what Travis Hunter was going to be as a freshman. And this is what I this is what I look at. He had two of his biggest accomplishments or biggest achievements that you'll have in a season. He got his first career touchdown and his first career interception, and they weren't on the same play. And that's what's impressive is because Travis Hunter is the type of player where you can sit back and say, yeah, he scored a touchdown and he got a pick. And we're talking about two different plays. There's not many players you can talk about that with. It's not. Maybe he got an interception and he had a fumble recovery. But for the most part, you ain't talking about an interception and a receiving touchdown. But that's what Travis Hunter had in one game for the first time. Both of them were his first. And of course, it's the first time that that he did that in the same game. We all know Hunter is a two-way player. We know that's what he was going to be coming into college. It was just about when was he going to be able to do it. I don't think dominant was fair because it takes a lot of work to be dominant on one side of the ball. And as a freshman, to be dominant on both sides of the ball? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know if with the, especially with the injury that he had, if he even had enough time playing football on the college level to develop into that. And maybe we would have seen it more so towards the end of his freshman year, but he missed a good amount of time that really kept him from being able to gain the experience necessary to achieve that goal. 
But the spring game ain't every game. Like I said, so that's just, that's just not fair. I think that this game against Alabama A&M was great. And it's a building block. You build here. How did we get here? You look at the Texas Southern game. I feel like this was this Alabama A&M game was just building on top of the TSU game. Against TSU, he was tested a lot. He had four pass breakups in that game. He hasn't had four pass breakups, you take that game away, all year. You know, he just doesn't get tested that often. But he got tested, and he had four pass breakups in that game. Well, instead of four pass breakups, he went ahead and said, I'm going to cash in these PBUs and get an interception. I'll take it. Then you look at Texas Southern, he had two catches for 25 yards and really a highlight play on the sideline where he put a fantastic move on a couple of the defenders for the Tigers, well, the TSU Tigers. Well, instead of just having a highlight play, let's go ahead and score a touchdown. I'll take it. It's about building blocks, and in the last two games, you can directly see how Travis Hunter built. Four pass breakups, the next game, let's turn that into an interception. A highlight-worthy play on the sidelines, the next game, let's turn that into a touchdown, both of which are elevations and both of which just show what Travis Hunter can fully be. Now, I don't know how much they're going to get him involved on the offense, but one, injuries, right? Maybe it was a plan to get him involved earlier and more. And then secondly, they clearly don't feel the need to use him much when it's a blowout, right? So when when Shador Sanders, or excuse me, when Deion Sanders was saying, well, we want you to see the full Travis Hunter, I first thought, okay, don't risk an injury don't do that and that made sense okay but then secondly i thought oh you talking about the two-way player fam you blow him out he's kind of injured no targets i don't even think i've seen him on offense southern they're blowing him out one target one i mean one catch that's it then you look at the other games campbell four catches this game here four catches tsu two catches that was a blowout later in the game but it wasn't that way for the most part Right. That just kind of started to build up. And that was the same way it was in 2021 as well. But in games that are closer, he's more involved, but he's not overly involved. And they have so many weapons that you don't need him to be. But promise you, he will be because that's the type of player that they were trying to recruit. A two way player who is fantastic on both sides of the ball. As a freshman, the realistic expectation was for Hunter to be impactful. Going forward, we'll see if he's able to become dominant. And that will be the full Travis Hunter experience throughout his career. But as a freshman, I think we just saw it against Alabama a and Going forward, I want to talk about one of our two North Carolina HBCUs we're going to break down. I'm talking about A&T because they had an injury scare and one that it really does give me a little bit of concern. But before I get into that, today's episode is brought to you by Simply Safe. Now, here's the thing about Simply Safe. It's been voted the number one, numero uno, not a single one better, no matter how you want to say it, top tier, the best home security system three years in a row. I don't know about you, but I personally value my safety. Maybe that's just a personal thing. Maybe it's just me because I like to be safe. I don't want to feel like I'm at risk at all times. But when I want to feel safe, I go to Simply Safe because there is no safe like Simply Safe. And here's the thing. They want to make sure that you're insured during, hol during holiday season when people are going to try to come up and see what's on your, your porch, want to take everything because it's, it's, uh, it's the season of giving. So they know that you're going to be receiving and they're going to come at you. Well, here's the thing about them. They're going to give you 50% off, 5-0, 50% off any Simply Safe housing system or security system just by going to the website simplysafe.com slash locked on college that is simplysafe.com slash locked on college go ahead and get that uh, security system 50 percent off as we keep on rolling on today's episode of locked on hbcu i appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day for your second listen of the day make sure you are checking out locked on sports today Peter Bukowski is going to bring on some of the local experts every single day to break down the national stories. So make sure you are informed on all of the biggest stories from the proper sources. And today's word of the day is magnanimous, meaning having or showing a generous and kind nature. Um, I want to talk about Jalen Fowler because his injury, his hairline fracture in his foot is the reason that I have a little bit of concern when it comes to North Carolina a and going into which, I mean, you can't understate the biggest game of their season, period. I'll say thus far, because if they win every other game after that will be bigger. But this is the biggest game that they played this year, period. I don't care what you want to say. Not the North Carolina Central game. Not the Campbell game. This right here is for a bid to the playoffs. There is not a bigger game 
that North Carolina A&T has played this year. There's not a game that is more important or has meant as much or has had as much impact as this game right here. It is literally do or die. With Jalen Fowler having a fracture in his foot, I'm concerned. He didn't start last week. He did come in in the second half. To me, that shows things are okay. That means he can play on it if you need him to. If you need him to. And I, I would argue that you might need him to in this game. If there was any game to try to fight through, it's this one. If there was any game to rest, it was last week. And they tried that. The fact that they went back to Jalen Fowler tells me they know they want and need to have him in the game. Or at least that's how they feel. I'd agree. I just believe the stats... They send a message that is hard to argue. Jalen Fowler is a big part of why or when this this offense just started to take off. Um, the only thing I will say is you want to make sure that you're not putting a player at risk. You want to make sure that, yes, the game is important, but there's going to be games, right? And you still probably feel like you can get some offense going. It's just better with Fowler. You don't want to put him at risk, though. That is the important part. Because everything's good in North Carolina a &T right now. Right? So you want to continue to streak. And that's why you want to bring him. You got seven games in a row that you've won. The longest stretch under Coach Washington. You know, Bayshaw Tootin is doing his thing every single week. Everything is good. So you want to keep Fowler in there. Keep a constant. But you just don't want to hurt the guy. But let me tell you why I'm concerned. They say he'll go. They say he'll play this weekend. But the reason I'm concerned in case he can, if anything happens, because I'm not a doctor, is because let's read off some of these stats. It's been nearly two months since they last lost. Jalen Fowler hasn't started the game that they lost. Any game that he's played significant time in, they've won. When you look at the Jalen Fowler-led North Carolina a t offense, it's significantly different from the three games before he played significant moments. He didn't start in that South Carolina State game, but he played pretty much the whole time. When Jalen Fowler is the quarterback, North Carolina a ts lowest yardage output is 307 yards. Prior to that, the highest was 357. The only time they went under that number was the 307 that I mentioned right before. So they've been getting more yards on a regular basis. You know, When you look at points, it's a huge discrepancy when you're talking about points. And I don't wanna hear about competition level because they only put up 13 points against North Carolina Central. They've been putting up 30, 40 points on a regular basis. When you look at Fowler as an individual, he's had five out of the six games that he played major time, or at least three or more quarters, I'll say his major time. Multiple touchdowns, you know? He's had multiple, uh, or excuse me, he had four straight 200-yard games until this week when he only played a half of football. He had 151. If he played a full game, he definitely was going to make it five in a row. Then you put Young Hooker in. So there was a reason to be concerned. You felt a certain kind of way about his health, right? About, about um, Fowler's health. So you put in Young Hooker. He starts the game. Things just don't go right. And I understand it's not all in his control. But things just don't go right. You don't score any points. You have 72 total yards in the first half. And then you put Fowler in. The only time you scored a touchdown was a kickoff return. But then you put Fowler in in the second half, and you have back-to-back -back touchdown drives. Of course, it stops there. I understand. So it wasn't like it was great offense. But it was better than what you were able to muster before he got in the game. And I've already ran down everything that has changed. More yards per game. Him as an individual has had really good stats. Four straight 200-yard games. He's had multiple touchdowns in five of the six games that he's played more than three quarters. But the points, you're averaging 12 points per game before Fowler gets in there. Since Fowler has picked up the reins and has played three or more quarters, you're averaging 40 points a game. That's the difference. The people around him, they still there. Still got Bayshaw too, and you still have it. But since Fowler's got in, the offense has just been a well-oiled machine, period. That's just how they maneuvered. So what do you want to say is correlation or causation? I don't know. But what I do know is that his presence has clearly made a difference. In this game, they only scored 20 points. But mind you, he only played a half of football. He did lead, lead 13 of those points. This is only the second time in his win streak, all of which were in games in which Jalen Fowler played three or more quarters, except this game. 
This is the second game that they scored under 38 points. So when Fowler leads the charge, they only scored under 38 points one time. But he plays three or more quarters, and that was 24 points. For the most part, they're dropping 38, 40, 50. The offense is just different when Jalen Fowler is in the game. And like I said, if nothing changes, it sounds like he's going to try to play. I hope he's safe. But it sounds like he's going to try to play. And I think that the North Carolina a t offense will be better because of it. Y'all need to start giving this team a little bit more respect. I'm not hearing enough about North Carolina a t in my opinion. But that's okay. Because I can't control what I hear, but I can't control what I say. North Carolina a t is a dog. And y'all will see because I believe that they will win the Big South. You just got to make sure that Jalen Fowler is healthy and ready to go. As we wrap up today's episode, though, we're going to make sure that we are talking about the other team in the in the conference, or excuse me, in the state, and that's North Carolina Central because they did just ensure their bid to the Celebration Bowl. Before I get into that, however, I want to tell you about Bet Online. Bet Online is my good friends, and if you want to make some money, make sure you're putting your money down on Bet Online. We want to make you money here. They want to make you money there, right? You know football. You know basketball. You know, you know, um, combat sports. How many people seen Izzy getting knocked out like that? Ooh, it was a good fight. It was a good fight. Wasn't like Usman where he was dominating the whole fight. It was a good fight, man. Even though he was winning that, that round, or excuse me, he was winning that fight. Ooh, that was a good fight. Did you put your money down on that happening? If you did on better line, you could have made yourself some good money. Could have made yourself some good money. The NFL season is going. The basketball season, NBA, and college are going. We're almost a bowl season. Put some money down on Bet Online and get your money there. It's bat, or excuse me, Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wage on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. As wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, we're switching over from North Carolina a t to North Carolina Central because they just won against Norfolk State. And more than that, they ensured themselves a spot in the Celebration Bowl. They are your MEAC champions in 2022. And for me, I feel like this is a great time to just kind of reflect on what they did this season, the highs and the lows of the year, and just how they were able to get to this point, right? Because the, the start of the season was a high. You knock off North Carolina a and and there's certain games, certain moments that I think are so pivotal because they just, they just determine your course. You know, and I don't know what happens with Central if they don't beat North Carolina a t But I do feel like knocking off your rival in the first game of the season and that finally type of moment, it was a propeller. It shot you up, pushed you up. It helped you out. It got you. It got your momentum going really early. Instead of needing a couple of games to build it, you did all of that in one game. Beat North Carolina a t momentum wise is kind of the equivalent of winning two or three in a row. Just beating, just beating your rival, period, right? That's how I feel about it. Now, you get to the next high. That's the New Hampshire win. You knock off New Hampshire, the number 25 team in the country. Oh, nobody's expecting that. And you go in there, you beat them pretty good. That's a good win. And now, MEAC dominance. Because I still think they dominated the MEAC. Even though they did lose a game, I think they dominated the MEAC. That's personally how I would describe it. Let's look at it. There's three wins that stand out. Norfolk State, Morgan State, and then also Howard. Of course, you lose to South Carolina State, and we'll get to that in the lows. But those first two, it's just timing. And maybe that's a little bit unfair to Morgan State because Morgan State has some good, some good wins. Morgan State has some good wins on their resume. Honestly, South Carolina State's a good win. Delaware State, a good win. Right? So we could end with this season seeing Morgan State as a top three team in the MEAC. That's very plausible. Matter of fact, I almost would say it's realistic. Right now, they're number three. And if they knock off Howard, they'll be number two. And then you knock off Howard. Or Norfolk State was just to win this, this conference. Like, like, you didn't show up to play around with, with Norfolk State. You acted like you knew you needed this game, and you went on, you dominated, period. You know? And then Howard, you beat a team that people are talking about could win the conference, and you beat them pretty badly. That was a statement win. Not the lows. It does come with that lose that loss to Campbell and that loss to South Carolina State. Those are the two games, right? Loss, lows. Campbell was just a low for as far as performance goes. It's like, man, you really laid an egg. And had people questioning if everything that came before it, including beating a top 25 team, was just a fluke. Was that fluky? Like, 
I don't know, man. You got dominated by Campbell. I don't, I don't know how to really feel about you. All right. Then you go to South Carolina State. And that wasn't even performance. That was just a result. I really feel like I didn't I did not believe that they were the best team in the MEAC after losing to South Carolina State. I just feel like they made a really bad mistake late in the game. Drop them, them lows because the highs came last, right? The low wasn't last. The high was last because they're ending on a high note. And when I look at them, I said it before, I'll say it again. I consistently believe that they are the best team in the MEAC. They have just showed the most consistency to me, whether that's out of conference or in conference. You know, Howard is the only team to me that actually matches their consistency in conference, but they lost to Central. So it's kind of like that's that's the tiebreaker. I believe that Howard is taking care of business, but so has Norfolk, or excuse me, so has North Carolina Central. That's how I look at it. I just feel like in conference, out of conference, they went in. Howard struggled out of conference mightily. So did South Carolina State. Everybody struggled out of conference except for North Carolina Central. So it was easy to paint a picture that they were the best team in the conference because that's how they look when they're going against teams like uh, um, North Carolina A&T, going against teams like New Hampshire. Yeah, you can bring up Campbell, but if I want to bring up Campbell, I can bring up those type of games for everybody else as well. I can. So... They just proved to me to have the most consistency when it came to being in conference. I think they're one bad interception from Davius Richard away from being undefeated in conference play. Right? I won't take that away from South Carolina State's defense because it's pretty good. But you can't sit here and tell me that they haven't looked good for the most part. You had two losses and one really bad loss. North Carolina Central has been a very consistent team, and I think they're really good. To me, I have them as like the fourth best team in HBCU football, I think, I mean, I can't count them out against Jackson State. You can't. You can't. I know we started all talking about Jackson State. We're going to end there, right, talking about it. But I want to look forward and talk about next week. I think I rest my players. I think I, I would play them about a half, and I think I would rest them because this game means nothing. Of course, you can just want to win. Of course, of course, of course. But this game doesn't mean anything. This game does not mean a thing. It's not a, a conference game. Who cares if you lose this matchup? It's not going to affect you. I want to make sure that my players are healthy. Conjunction, Conjunction, not playing. Resting them, period. Not playing them. All game, not half. Davis Richard, probably going to rest them after the second half. I do my best to try to build up a big lead in the first 30 minutes of play. After that, my players are on ice. I'm resting them and making sure that everybody is healthy for the celebration bowl. There's no need to risk it. There's absolutely no reward from winning this game. And there's absolutely no detriment from losing this game. So why would I put my players in a position so that they can get hurt in a game that comes before the biggest game of the year and really doesn't hold any weight? It's not going to make it to no playoffs. It's not going to increase my stock. And even if it did, it doesn't matter because I'm going to be in the exact same place just with higher stock. I'm good. I'm going to make sure that my players are healthy, and that's what I would do in the last week of the season, treating that like a preseason game. Y'all get a half of football. If you really want to win this game, extend the lead in the first half. Y'all have done it before, do it again. But I'm going to rest my players. And I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen of the day, make sure you're checking out Locked On Sports Today with Peter Bukowski, bringing on all of the local experts to break down the national stories wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube, Odyssey, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. On tomorrow's episode, is FAMU trying to make a playoff push? And do they have a legitimate chance? I've wrote them off before, but I'm not so sure I can anymore. I appreciate that, though, y'all. So, if, you, if you're trying to keep up with me in the meantime, in between time, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.